Hi everybody, this is Matt Ingram again with Replication 3B. Uh, Replication 3 uh, is a reproduction of the results reported by Steve Messner and his co-authors in 2013, the Justice Quarterly piece we've read for class. The B portion of the replication uh, is done in R. Looking at an overview of Replication 3, we are doing the replication in three different environments, Geoda, R, and Python. If you're doing these in sequence, then you've already done the replication in Geoda. Uh, we are now doing it in, in R, and then you would do it in Python. Uh, as I stated before, with regards to the replication in Geoda, the focus of the replication is on the robbery rates component of the analysis reported in the article. Messner et al. examined both robbery rates and assault rates. The tools and techniques for examining robbery rates are the same as those for examining assault rates, so we're just going to focus on the analysis of robbery rates here, and then I leave uh, the replication of the results regarding assault rates uh, to you on your own time. Um, also, Messner et al. report that their core results use a spatial weights matrix of 15 nearest neighbors. However, they do conduct several uh, sensitivity or robustness checks, uh, specifically with 13 nearest neighbors and 17 nearest neighbors. The replication here only does the analysis with the connectivity structure of uh, 15 nearest neighbors. I'll leave the robustness checks with 13 and 17 nearest neighbors to you. Uh, some other preliminaries. Uh, at this point, I, I assume that you've downloaded and installed R. Uh, really, at this time, you, you should be fairly familiar with the R environment since this is the third replication we're, we're doing. I also assume that you've downloaded all of the replication materials from the course site on Blackboard. So the replication steps that uh, we will conduct include the following. Uh, we uh, we'll uh, replicate all of the main empirical results uh, reported from pin page 1027 forward in the article. Figures 1 and 2 report percentile maps. Uh, we will only rep uh, replicate figure 1 since that one uh, is the uh, percentile map for robbery rates. Figure 2 is the one for assault rates, so I'll leave figure 2 to you. Figures 3 and 4 report LISA cluster maps. Figure 3 is the one for robbery rates, so we'll replicate that here. I'll leave figure 4 to you. We'll then generate an OLS model and uh, conduct some spatial diagnostics to determine what form of uh, a spatial process we should model in our spatial regression. If all of our results and diagnostics um, follow Messner at all, then that should lead us to a spatial error model, or SEM. Uh, which we will execute in tables 1 and 2. Again, table 1 is for robbery rates, so that's the, those are the models, the two models from table 1 that we will re replicate uh, in this video, and I'll leave uh, the models of assault rates in table 2 uh, to you on your own time. Uh, just a quick note that the weights, the spatial weights used by uh, Messner et al. are symmetric, so we will need to generate those symmetric weights in R. So let's take a quick look at the article and then move to move to R. Uh, the article, the original article, is is this one uh, from Justice Quarterly in 2013. The article originally uh, originally appeared online in 2011, but appeared in print in 2013. And uh, as I mentioned in the Geoda replication, there's a lot of good uh, theoretical motivation and background and context in the first few pages of the article. I expect that you have read the full article and that you're familiar with this theoretical framing and context, uh, but the replication itself will focus on the uh, empirical results uh, beginning on page 1027. So we're mainly concerned with section 5 of the article, and as the authors state here, their first empirical results are a set of percentile maps. So let's move to those percentile maps. This is the first percentile map um, reported by the authors. So it's the percentile map of robbery rates, and the highest 
10% of values are in dark gray. You can see them sort of scattered around northern Germany in the upper portion of the map. And the lowest 10%, or the bottom uh, decile, you could say, of, of <coughs> excuse me, of the distribution are in light gray, and you can see those distributed primarily in southern Germany. So let's try to reproduce this in R. Uh, let's minimize this and move to R. Here is our R script. Uh, again, I'm working in the R GUI interface. If you're working in the R Studio interface, it will look a little slightly different, but the contents of the R script should be the same. At the top, I've got some basic introductory uh, material, including some acknowledgments to people from whom I, I've borrowed um, and adapted uh, portions of the code. I've got some helpful commands here in case you need to reference them at a later time. And then if you haven't already done so, you should install the necessary packages and then opening, open them using the install packages and library commands. Uh, here I've already executed all of this, so my, my packages are installed and uh, opened and ready to be used. So um, make sure you do that first and then uh, <coughs> we'll move forward. The next step is to set the working directory. If you don't know what your working directory is, you can use this get working directory command. Again, if you highlight the command in the R script and hit control R, it will execute it. You can see here that this is my working directory. I'm, I'm in the Messner et al. Re uh, replication and in a working folder. Just make sure you set your own working directory uh, on your machine using the file path on your machine. We can list the files inside that working directory. And the main shapefile that has all the data for the replication is this map10.shp. Uh, so we want to open that. Uh, we could see what kind of shapefile it is using this get info command, but let's just load the shapefile using the read shape spatial command. Uh, the shape the f the file has loaded successfully. R just changed the name here so that it could read the variable labels. It might have been a a, a duplicate uh, label, so that that's what it looks like happened here. It found a duplicate label, so it just created a one and a two. Uh, but we can now summarize the contents of that file. We can see all of our variable labels and a summary of the distribution of each variable. We can also extract the data frame by using this command here. This essentially extracts the DBF portion of the shapefile. And then we can look at the variable labels or the variable names in that data frame. Here's a, just a quick summary of all the variable labels. We can see that our, our, our data set is complete. If we wanted to look at the first five observations, we could use the head uh, command. If we wanted to look at the last five, we could look at the tail just to do a quick inspection of the data. However, let's just go ahead and attach the data set. Uh, by attaching it, we can now reference the variables in that data set without having to reference the data set every time. So if you had the need to do so, you could uh, write a new shapefile. If you, if you had made adjustments or added new variables to the shapefile, you could use this command to write out a new revised shapefile. If you were missing a, pr a projection component of the shapefile, you could use these commands to generate that projection component. And then if you wanted to transform the, the, the projection, um, you could do that using this, uh, this command. We're not going to do any of those steps right now as part of the replication, so let's just go ahead and confirm that we are working with the right um, geometry or geography. Uh, so if we highlight plot shape, and do control R, we should get that confirmation. And there we have it, just our, our basic um, plot of the lines of the polygons that constitute our underlying geography. Um, and if we just take a quick look at the outline of the map in the, in the published article, we can see that we're working with the right uh, geography. If we wanted to add axes to this <coughs> map, we could do that here, um, and we could do we could add some labels if we wanted as well. Let's skip ahead here and 
generate the percentile map. So to generate the percentile map, we first need to extract the percentiles, and we use that. We do that with this quantile command. So the quantile command extracts these percentages that are specified by the user here. So here I'm asking for the the tenth, the first decile, and the top decile uh, of the in the distribution of this variable. Robbery rates, the raw robbery rates from 2005 to 2007. Keep in mind that the data set includes both the raw robbery rates and logged robbery rates, as well as the raw assault rates and logged assault rates. Uh, we should be using the raw rates at this stage. We'll use the logged uh, rates later on in the regression analysis, um, where the uh, distribution, where we want to make sure that there is a normal distribution to or at least an approximately normal distribution to each of the variables that we're using in the analysis. So at this point, if we if we extract these uh, two deciles, um, we could type quant over here if you just wanted to see what it what it looked like. Um, you can see that this is what has the object that has resulted. So the the lowest 10% of values on this distribution are below 11.241, and the highest 10% of values are above 99.1. We could now make turn quant into a matrix, so let's just transform this into a matrix. Again, if we typed quant now here, you can see that quant is a single vector or a column vector. Uh, consisting of two rows. Right? So we have the first row is 11.241 and the second row is 99.103. Now we want to generate a new variable, quant2, that equals 1 if robbery rates are below the first row in the quant matrix. So we're going to set quant2 equal to 1 if the robbery rates are part of the first decile. We're then going to set quant2 equal to 2 if robbery rates are above the ten, uh, the tenth decile, or up in the tenth decile, so above 99.103. So if we execute those two commands and then do a summary of quant2, you can see that quant2 equals 1 or 2. It's, it's really just a categorical variable. Um, and uh, we've now set a, we've created a variable that captures these two deciles and leaves everything else unmarked. So let's set two colors, gray and black, and then later we're going to use those colors uh, to attach them to the, va the values of quant2, and we can plot this percentile graph then using these commands. So let's just grab this entire set of code uh, just a couple of clarifications. This code here is just going to expand the margin, so you can you don't have all of this white space that you see around this plot over here. So it's just going to adjust the margins. This is actually going to do the plotting of your shapefile. Uh, so without expanding any margins, we could just grab this line and execute it, and you can see that there's the percentile map. But now let's adjust the margins and give it a title and make it a look a little bit. Uh, prettier. So there's our graph, and we can compare it now to the published uh, graph, and we can see a nice correspondence there. Right, this is essentially the same graph. I'm I'm not seeing any discrepancies here. There shouldn't be any. Um, so this is a nice rep reproduction of Figure One the lowest 10% and the top 10% of values of robbery rates. So you could do the same thing again if you wanted to for uh, figure 2, which is assault rates. We won't do that here. Let's move on to figure 3. This is figure 3 on the left now. A LISA cluster map, or what the authors call a Moran scatter plot. Same thing, the terms are interchangeable. Uh, showing several regions of high-high clusters 
in the northern part of Germany. Those are marked by this dark gray and then a large region of low, low clusters in southern Germany. So let's see if we can replicate that in R. Let's close our window here. Uh, to do that we need to generate our spatial weights. This is this was the first item in the replication assignment, um, but we can do that here now. And this is the command that we would do that. Basically we want to extract the coordinates from the shapefile. We then want to um, grab the row names from the shapefile and create a set of IDs that equal the row names. And then we're going to create different um, weights matrices based on the nearest, the, a number of nearest neighbors uh, and using the coordinates to to find the distances to neighbors to identify which, which of the neighbors are the nearest ones, are indeed the nearest ones. So this line generates the, the a weights matrix of 13 nearest neighbors, this line generates a weights matrix for 15 nearest neighbors, and this line generates a weights matrix for 17 nearest neighbors. So let's grab all of this and do all of them. So now we've generated all three. Uh, we could plot them if you wanted to, to see them all separately. Uh, we could plot them with different colors. Uh, I like this plot with different colors just because you can see uh, which ones are overlapping. So the black ones are the 13 nearest neighbors, then below that you can see 15 nearest neighbors with blue, and then on top of additional ties that are not black or blue are shown in red that are the 17 nearest neighbors. That sh helps to, to see the increasing number of links as you move from black t to blue to red. But another way to look at this would be to include them all in one graph. That's what this section does. Um, so here you see the shapefile on its own, the shapefile with 13 nearest neighbors, 15 nearest neighbors, and 17 nearest neighbors. And it might not be easy to see with the naked eye, but you can see it, you can see in certain places of the graph that the the t the density of ties uh, is getting increasingly uh, increasingly dense. Sorry to be repetitive. So let's move uh, forward. We'd want to create a list object. Rem remember that all, many of the spatial functions in R require a list object, not just a, uh, a neighbor, uh, uh, a list, a neighbor list, uh, excuse me, a neighbor object. So it doesn't, re it requires a list underscore W object, not an NB object is the way R would, uh, would say it. But we also want it to be symmetric and uh, row standardized. So let's move down here since since that is the spatial weights matrix that is used in the piece. Uh, they explicitly say they use symmetric uh, weights matrices generated in R. So let's generate the 15 nearest neighbors one. This is, you can see on the left, we've, we've successfully generated a symmetric version of the 15 nearest neighbors weights matrix. Then let's make this a a list object that is row standardized. Again, the style W makes it row standardized. Uh, you can look up the syntax for this command. If, if it were style equal to B, it would be a binary weights matrix and there are some other styles uh, as well. But we want the row standardized weights matrix. So let's execute that. And we could write it out here as a gal file for Geoda. We did this already in the Geoda replication, but here it is again. If you wanted to write it out as a gal file again, you could just execute this command again and then import the gal file, the symmetric weights matrix, into Geoda. Now that we have our symmetric weights matrix, let's uh, examine some global spatial dependence and generate our LISA clusters. Uh, so these are, these are the commands for Moran's I. Uh, let's make list W equal the symmetric weights matrix and then um, we can generate the Moran's test. Here it is 262. Uh, I note here that the global, global Moran is not reported in the paper but that's not that's not exactly true. It's, it's reported in passing here. 
but let's just sorry while I update this the Moran's eye is 262 if we go to the paper you can see it's reported in uh, passing here on page 1028 I believe um, you can see here that the Moran's eye um, so sorry that's those that's the OL that's those, those are, that's the analysis of the residuals of the OLS model so no uh, sorry, it, it was it was correct. I the global Moran was not reported in the paper, so I'm I'm going to leave that. So this is the global spatial dependence for robbery rates. You could repeat this analysis for assault rates, um, and I can do that here just to see that it's slightly less. That's 106, so 0.262, and statistically. Where is the, there's the p-value. So there's statistically significant and also statistically significant for assault rates. There are several other variations depending on your assumptions, uh, including a permutation analysis for Moran's eye. We've done this before with the previous analysis. I'll leave that up to you if you'd like to do that here. But let's skip ahead to the LISA cluster map since that is one of the main parts of the replication. Um, this is the basic function for generating a local Moran and then here is um, the function for this replication or the command structure, the syntax for this particular replication. So we could, uh, we've already done this, but we could select our uh, weights matrix again here. Just make sure that it's the symmetric 15 nearest neighbors one. And then here is our basic command for the local Moran. This is with no adjustments for the p-values. So this is just your straightforward uh, basic default calculation of the local Moran. Um, we've got our variable here our weights matrix here and we've specified that there are no adjustments. So if we execute that and summarize it, here is a summary of, of the Mor local Moran's eye and a summary of the probability values. It, so the this is a, a in the first column of this object are the local Moran's eye and in the fifth column are the probability values. We could do a histogram of the Moran's eye that's what that's what that looks like and if we do a histogram of the probability values that's what that looks like this first bar here is are all of the values below 0.05 so you see that there's a more than 120 maybe close to 130 uh, units that have statistically significant Moran values this is another variation that is sometimes recommended in the literature but the advice that uh, uh, I've been seeing and that Will has also been looking up and that we've been talking about in class, the advice from uh, Robert Roger Bivand and his colleagues is that the only reliable way to generate results about local Moran is with the saddle point and exact methods. So let's take a look at that below. Uh, like let's just specify the NB object and the weights object again. Uh, again, the, the neighbor object is is one way of specifying the weights matrix. Uh, the list object is another way of doing it for R. So this is the LISA one is your basic default method. And now this is the way of specifying the saddle point method, which I will call LISA 1S. So we want to refresh or just make sure that we've extracted the data frame and then we want to generate a new model of the linear model uh, with just the constant so we're trying to estimate the dependent variable of interest with just a constant using that data so if we execute those commands and then we execute the saddle point estimation on that model object using an NB object, the neighbor object, which we've specified up here. 
So let's execute this command here. It should take about five or ten seconds. There it is, success. And then we can estimate the exact command using this syntax here. So let's do that as well. Should also take about five or ten seconds. There it is, it's done. We could summarize all of these values. I'll leave that up to you. We could also compare or visually inspect the first five observations of each one. Uh, we could also extract the mean of all of the LISA values to see what they look like. Uh, that's one way to quickly inspect to see what, what, what difference there is. The mean of... Sorry, I included a Moran test in there, but the mean of the basic LISA value is 0.262. Uh, that's essentially the same as the local as the global Moran's test, right? So that's not surprising. But then the saddle point is 0 0.26 274, slightly higher, and the exact value is also 274. So the saddle point and the exact methods are estimating a slightly higher amount of global spatial dependence. We could also do some histograms of all three of these values. So this is the histogram of the basic one. This would be a histogram of the saddle point. Let me just shift over here so you can see them. And a histogram of the exact method. All of them are fairly similar. We could plot them all together. So they could be compared. Again, they're, they're all substantially similar and then we could do a slightly more colorful version of the same graph. Again, the, the overall pattern is that they're very similar, no, no major departures. But now we'd want to graph them, or plot them as a map, rather. So uh, let's do that. Uh, before we move on, though, just the, the, the practical takeaway from all of this is that you'd probably want to do at least three different uh, estimates of your local Morans in R, the, the basic local Moran command and then the saddle point and the exact methods. Um, if there's no meaningful differences across the three methods, then you're on very firm ground. If there are some meaningful differences, then you'd probably want to use the more conservative uh, method, the one that is uh, estimating the, the least amount of significance or the or the lowest number of significant units in which there is a, a statistically significant LISA value. But for now, let's uh, let's just plot uh, one LISA cluster map with just the basic LISA value. So let's call LISA LISA1. Uh, we could add this value to a shape file, but let's just execute the basic uh, LISA cluster map with LISA1. So we'll just repeat this. We're calling LISA LISA1. This is the weights matrix we're using. Our dependent variable, uh, sorry, it should just be the raw rates. Dependent variable is the raw rates. And we're going to define our quadrant, a new variable called quadrant. We're going to center our dependent variable in our lagged dependent variable. You could do these plots if you wanted to. I'm going to skip them right now. And now let's just define our quadrants. And if we didn't define any significance cutoff or significance threshold, then this set, this block of code would plot our uh, LISA cluster map showing no cutoffs in statistically significance, statistical significance, excuse me. It's basically going to be showing that everything's statistical, statistically significant. So let's just execute that. And this is what it looks like, right? There are no units in white. Everything looks statistically significant. And overall, the pattern seems to match the published graph. Right? A lot of low, low clusters in the south, high, high clusters in the north, and some other high, low, and low, high clusters. But now let's set a uh, cut off for statistical significance. Uh, let's move down here to this new plot with statistical significance. Our p-values are going to come from that fifth column of the LISA object. Uh, so now we're going to set the quadrant equal to 5. That's going to be our 
statistically non-significant. And now let's set our quadrants back to values of 1 through 4 only if p is less than or equal to 0.05. So let's execute that. Set our new colors. We're adding white in over here on the end. And now we can plot this. Let's, let's add a legend and some title. If you added the top line here and the bottom line PNG and develop off, it would basically export this to your working directory. But let's just grab this code so it plots the, f the graph without actually exporting the file. And this is what it looks like. So here we see some results that are broadly consonant with those reported by Messner et al. Uh, sorry, that's the percentile map. Here's the Moran scatter plot. And so we see uh, several regions of high, high clusters in the northern part of Germany and a large uh, region of low, low, low clusters in the southern part of Germany. Um, this is, there's some minor differences here between the plot that they reported and the plot that we're reporting. That's essentially because the plot that they're reporting, uh, I, I'm almost sure, was was ex was um, generated using Geoda, which uses the permutation uh, method to establish statistical significance, and we're using uh, these more these analytical methods, uh, the local Moran, the saddle point, and the exact methods. Again, Roger Bivend would suggest that this is the more uh, conservative method. Uh, Luke Anselin and Serge Ray, uh, I haven't asked them explicitly, but I would assume that they would prefer the permutation analysis, saying that the analytical method is less reliable. Um, but essentially, we've just reproduced uh, the, the maps. We could just do one more using the saddle point. Let's, let's execute this with the saddle point. Um, just going to change this to the raw version. Let's execute all of this with the saddle point. Um, and move to the plot with significance. And generate the new graph and see what that looks like. There's a few more uh, Liza cluster maps um, here with the saddle point which is interesting, or a few more high, high clusters, but overall the, the result is, is very similar. And I've got code here where you could you could replicate a third LISA cluster map if you wanted with just the, the exact method, again with the raw rates, um, just to see what, what that looks like, but overall I wouldn't expect uh, any major differences. So that takes us, <coughs> excuse me, through figures three and four. Again, we only replicated figure three, the LISA cluster map for robbery rates. You could replicate figure four, the LISA cluster map for assault rates on your own. Uh, in the next video, we'll do the spatial regressions. Thank you.